we have I'm just waiting for a couple more panelists. Um, yes. Just give a couple more minutes. Sure. Because I know that we have Shibuya when it was joining as a panelist. Um, Mario is trying to get in. And that's it. Oh, Luba. But I haven't heard from Luba, so maybe she can't do it anymore. I mean, we can... Part. What do you guys think? COVID-19, and no surprise there, uh, it's affecting us in every way, in the marketplace, economics, um, diplomacy, healthcare systems and as the vaccine rollout continues we're starting to think about how this will be in the future future implications and trends we're looking at both from emerging economies to um, established countries the differences that are happening there and how this might affect growth as in entrepreneurship startups um and even global aid where we're, we're looking at you know uh, emerging economies maybe looking for more resources and um what that flow will look like. So I'm excited because we have a lot of really interesting perspectives. We have two more panelists that are joining that we're just waiting on, but we thought we would jump in. And just because it's a small group, I definitely encourage, and Scott knows this because we were chatting earlier about this um, on our pre-call, how we can have a dynamic conversation. If someone is strikes a topic that you want to dive into more, feel free to jump in. It doesn't just have to be me. Um, asking questions uh, since this isn't a traditional event with a stage um, like in the olden days. <laughs> so um, with that, I'll do a quick intro. I'm Natalie Byrne. I'm today's moderator. I run a social impact Resources, um, marketplace, consumer reach, mobilization, advocacy work with the United Nations, or um, thinking about foundational giving as an investment in um, capital markets. So, kind of taking a, a new approach to that. Um, so, I would love to get over to Scott to introduce himself, um, and and maybe with your introduction, each of the panelists can just share something about. You know, touching on what you do, and then also how maybe COVID-19 has changed the way you approach what you do. Because I think that's an interesting way to look at our jobs as they are ever evolving. Sure. Thanks so much, Natalie. Yeah, it's great to be here. Um, so my name is Scott Rosenstein. I am a uh, public health professor at the Bard College Globalization and International Affairs Program. I also uh, work at the Eurasia Group, which is a, uh, a political risk consulting firm. Uh, where we look at, where we work with all different types of clients to help them better understand the politics, the economics, the social stability risks around the world, and how that affects their investments. So my background is pandemic preparedness. I have been, I graduated from, I finished graduate school in 2004, which was sort of the beginning, beginning of the post SARS era. And I've been, and I've sort of been working in that uh, space since then, thinking a lot about what could happen if there was a significant global pandemic that uh, re that resembled SARS or possibly uh, was uh, more serious, more severe. Uh, and so the last year has been quite an experience. Some things were expected, some things were unexpected. I think that 
a lot of the things we're seeing on you know, vaccine diplomacy, around vaccine manufacturing, around the challenges around vaccinating the entire world to a novel infectious disease, I think was, you know, to, to be honest, I think it's actually going a little better than many people expect. I think there was an expectation that many countries would be shut out early on. Uh, and that hasn't been the case as much. You know, obviously there's incredible challenges around equity. One of the things I think we didn't think about as much or we hadn't incorporated was the the incredible challenges a number of developed economies would have around politics, around information, uh, around uh, navigating this uncertain environment and how, you know, really at the end of the day, the largest health burden is going to land on a number of developed economies. I mean, some of that is because of demographics, but some of that is because of the response. It wasn't, uh, wasn't uh, there. What the preparedness wasn't there. All of the work that we've been doing since SARS, a lot of it went out the door, and that's been been a real challenge. Moving forward, I think you know we're, it'll be interesting to see if we follow in this panic and do nothing cycle, or if this will really be a game changer in terms of uh, really making the long term investments for pandemic preparedness, for all different types of health emergencies uh, that we're likely going to see in the future. And I think, you know, I think it's quite possible there could be a lot of opportunities. I think what we've seen on the vaccine front has been pretty inspiring. There's going to be a lot more interest in testing. There's also just a lot more interest in understanding how to navigate these very uh, diverse, uncertain waters with different communities and different populations. And that's going to be a big challenge moving forward. I'll stop there. That was great. And I think out of everybody, just you are you had great job security there with being <laughs> on the front of thinking about this for a very long time. So thank you for that, because I am sure um, your strategy helped us navigate some of these uh, minefields, really. Um, Shanti, would you jump in and, and introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks, Natalie. And uh Good day, everyone. Um, morning, afternoon, evening. Um, my name is Shanti Shamdasani. I'm the founder of S ASEAN International Advocacy and Consultancy. This is a private consulting firm established in 2010. And uh, before that, I've had 18 years of experience in healthcare. I spent 10 years with Pfizer in India, Indonesia, and uh, eight years with Johnson and Johnson around the re around the region. So given my healthcare background um, and, and, you know, coming into the uh, storm of what we call the COVID-19 pandemic, what I've actually uh, observed is that aside from people and, and you know, individual uh, uh, and, and companies jumping in to provide all types of assistance on, at the early onset of COVID, all the PPEs and whatnot, what uh, we have done is that we have seen that some of the countries are actually receiving compromised uh, quality of vaccine. So we quickly jumped in, uh, and because of my experience working with Gavi, uh, uh, it's a global uh, network for vaccine, I do know that some of the, uh, not the donated part, but some of those, the, the vaccine that are being sold, uh, sold being through the black market and, and uh, compromised quality. I just want to, to give you a different angle to this because everyone would be talking about the same thing. I want to talk about something totally different. So what we did was we established an association called Global Vaccine Watch. And uh, we detect areas where, you know, the vaccines are not stored in the, temp in the right temperature. People were just tampering with it and it kind of like just injecting it just because this was donated or this has come from at a, this uh, comes at a cheaper price. So we went out and did a lot of education and advocacy uh, uh, to people in terms of what to look uh, for a vaccine that, you know, you, it, they need to unpack it in front of you. It needs to come in a certain temperature and all that thing. So that's that's one thread. Uh, we will see this because, you know, now vaccines are being rolled out and it will take another three, four years, maybe until, you know, majority of the population is vaccinated. But this is something that we need to continuously advocate and, and look out for. Another thing um, uh, that I would like to highlight, aside from uh, vaccine diplomacy, which we have done quite a bit of online events on this one and uh, experts have spoken on this, um, 
the diplomacy is fine. Everybody's aware that there is a diplomacy going on behind this, you know, which countries get first, what's the price, the negotiation and whatnot and whatnot. That's that's basically a different part of the thing. But what I would like to highlight here is the infrastructure and the future threat of of world infrastructure that uh, we may be facing. And let me just take two, three minutes to, to explain what do I mean by this. Um, you have heard about the uh, Belt Road initiatives that is pioneered by China. Uh, you have also seen that how developing countries, um, not developed, but developing countries are getting loans to build their infrastructure, to build the roads and, and other, other uh, uh, necessities in order to uh, enhance the economy. And with the pandemic that has really hit globally, that has stopped. So all this project that was ongoing probably has halted. Uh, a lot of money has been pet, uh, kept in there. And sometimes the developing countries have committed more than what their GDP amounts to. So this is another threat. Most of the developing countries are under this sort of like threat of not just a debt trap, but uh, really going down into the, uh, you know, uh, semi-economic poverty trap, uh, plus the infrastructure that, that has been really uh, gearing on this. So, again, I would see that, you know, in three, four years' time, you will see developing developed countries really far ahead and the developing countries really far behind, and the gap goes, grows bigger as a result of this pandemic. So I'll stop there. And, um, you know, maybe later on we can get into discussion. Yeah, Thank I have you. a question to ask you about that. But this is actually a great segue. Um, Shibuya, you and I were chatting the other day about some of what you're looking at even with innovation and, and your work as COVID-19 has led there. We don't have to start there. I want you to introduce yourself so everyone gets a chance to hear more about your interesting background. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Nathalie. So uh, good morning, good evening to all. So I'm uh, Commander Shibu, now just Shibu. I was in the Navy earlier. I'm a veteran. I was a naval architect when I was in the Navy, you know, designing warships and uh, those kind of things. Uh, post uh, the uh, naval uh, side, now I'm uh, more into the innovation sector and the software side of uh, things. So what we do, we operate a couple of verticals. One is a co-working space where we work with innovation and things like that. Then we have a software division which does uh, software development and stuff like that. Uh, we are also there on the uh, environmental side, on the marine uh, side. That's, uh, that's the third one. So uh, basically how uh, COVID affected us, uh, uh, in, in pretty interesting ways, which we never fathomed that things will happen like this. Uh, one is on the uh, innovation side. So if I look at the software division, how how it affected the software division, uh, we, uh, we immediately uh, went into a work from home model, uh, which we never thought we would, but we transitioned pretty quickly, maybe transitioned uh, overnight. Everybody shifted into their homes and then they started working. And uh, the uh, situation has been kind of uh, good for us on the software side. Uh, we are there on the healthcare side as well as on the registry side. And the uh, business kind of grew there uh, with the work from home model. I mean, something which we never envisaged. Going forward there, uh, uh, people say that uh, we may not come back to office in the near future. We will continue to work in the work from home mode. Uh, that's 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 one part of it. And where we were on the co-working side, uh, got badly affected during the pandemic. Everybody just left. Uh, it went from full to zero in uh, just one month. Uh, the recovery has been very sharp. It's a V-shaped recovery. Uh, the interesting part is uh, we could see uh, many of the uh, companies innovate rapidly and change and adapt to the uh, emerging situation. Uh, so it, it, it's really nice uh, to see that uh, the human spirit didn't succumb to the uh, new world, but rather innovated and adapted and uh, started uh, coming up pretty fast. So those those are the two things. On the healthcare mm -hmm. front, uh, again, we are building products on the EMR front and on the PHR side. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have, uh, of course, uh, we, we work 
on those things uh, considering the new realities of the world so how uh, how patients uh, can interact how the encounters will happen with the doctors uh, and uh, so on and so forth i think uh, so that that's a brief uh, background about things that i do that's great thank you so much and we are joined by our uh, fourth panelist mario so happy to have you on here. Um, we had a little tech difficulty, so just just a quick reminder of the prompt, a chance to intro yourself, and also just connect on how COVID nineteen has has changed, you know, your your every day. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, it's uh, uh, such an honor to join this group. And uh, my name is Mario Badur, and I am the uh, global uh, chief operating officer for a public company, StarTech. Uh, we are in the outsourcing space. Uh, we are in 13 different countries uh, with uh, uh, 45,000 uh, employees across the globe. So um, uh, as you know, in, in our industry, when you build contact centers, uh, social distancing is almost impossible. And, and COVID really changed the dynamics and the construct on how we do business. And you had to pivot to an at-home uh, platform uh, pretty fast, uh, with moving uh, thousands of employees to work remotely and virtually from work across um, countries that are not necessarily equipped with high-speed internet, uh, dedicated home offices, uh, et cetera. So, so it definitely uh, accelerated a lot of uh, uh, digital technology that uh, we were looking at deploying three and five years time and uh, the pandemic forced the industry to look into deploying such technology uh, in, in a matter of months versus years. So from that perspective, the pandemic helped in, in accelerating technology and innovation. Um, it also helped um, businesses such as ours to realize that uh, we can cast the net across the globe and, and service uh, clients uh, remotely, uh, virtually from any, uh, anywhere versus being locked to a certain country or a certain geography. And perhaps we can talk about that more. Um, there is also a, I want to bring it back to the vaccine, there is a uh, certain level of uh, uh, responsibility or pressure, if you will, to uh, help and uh, contribute into vaccinating mass amount of employees so they can get back to work in the construct of a brick and mortar and call center. So, and I believe uh, this is, we are one company uh, amongst many, many other uh, others in the sector and in the industry, and um, as we all look into vaccinating employees, so on and so forth, I believe will make a, a big impact uh, uh, in the workforce in general. So uh, I'll keep it at that for now. But I, I, uh, I know I'm joining late a little bit. I apologize, uh, but I'm glad that I'm able to uh, uh, participate. Well, just since you just made a good point, I'd love to just you know have you dive a little bit further into the innovation that you're seeing. COVID-19 open because we were having a lot of conversations on so much that's been um, shut down, held back, you know, poverty, even here in Los Angeles where I'm based is extraordinarily high, food insecurity at crazy levels, storefronts shutting. So that's something that we all see no matter where you're based, everyone has seen these effects, but I think it would be great with the note that you just made a little bit about the innovation and what you're seeing kind of emerge. Look, uh, so, so, uh, connect you to the to the clients, to to customers. Um, you need certain uh, 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 privacy uh, filters uh, 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 built in and the architecture, so and so on and so forth. So take all that and think of it as you're rebuilding a mini call center at the premises of someone's home. Um, today, when you're calling in to inquire about your bank account or your health insurance, uh, uh, there are many uh, compliance regula regulatories that we have to abide with to be compliant, whether it's PCI, payment credit card uh, industry, or, or HIPAA, if it comes to healthcare or GDPR, um, so now you had to put all that technology in someone's home 
and almost um, I'll give you an example. Um, in in your office, you have eye, what I call eyes in the sky, and you have cameras uh, that, that controlling any potential non-compliance fraud or someone writing credit card numbers perhaps on a piece of paper or someone's uh, uh, private network information on a piece of paper, or someone's address. You can't see that when someone's working from home. Uh, some of the technologies that um, uh, arise, which is which was fascinating, is the ability to detect a smartphone around someone's desk in their home office um, uh, through a an electromagnetic uh, uh, piece of hardware that you put, and uh, it will flag the supervisor or the manager whether someone has. Uh, is not abiding by clean desk policy and have a, a smartphone around them. Uh, if someone is um, uh, left, uh, per perhaps uh, Mario is supposed to be logging into the schedule to the shift today and someone else is coming in to do his work, uh, there is a facial recognition similar to how you unlock your smartphone today that uh, became part of the desktop at home where the manager of that individual or supervisor is notified if the facial um, uh, characteristic of the employee are not the same. So they can be taken off the network immediately, disconnected from the cloud. So these are fascinating technologies that we never had access to before. And we, we felt we were years um, uh, uh, still behind. And, and uh, we saw that, uh, it, these things happen in a matter of months last year. Right. Thank you for sharing that. And Scott, you spoke with me recently about, you know, you having oversight on how the pandemic is affecting markets. It's infecting the way people are investing. It's infecting diplomacy. I mean, we saw so quickly with the AstraZeneca vaccine, how even consumer perception um, quickly shifted, you know, how countries are interacting with, with vaccine rollout. So as this continues and we have more access to, to this, I'm curious from your sort of bird's eye view, what, where you're kind of leaning in on. Well, so one of the, one of the most interesting features of this pandemic, I would say is, so in the beginning, you know, there was, everyone was looking for examples or for comparisons. The easiest one was obviously 2003 SARS. If you were talking to people in the financial services sector, they would say, I'll tell you what's going to happen. This will be a V-shaped recovery. There will be some hits to the travel and trade. Uh, you know, there will be some challenges here and there. Um, but ultimately, the, this, uh, these market challenges will be temporary, and then the market will go like this, a V. I think uh, that was not correct. Part of the reason why it wasn't correct was the, the sort of the underestimation of the virus, the longevity, the way it spread. Uh, and then and the impact on you know on different regions, but what we're seeing right now is a, you know a term which you know some of you may be familiar, which is the K-shaped recovery. This is where you know the a lot of uh, you know a lot of investors, a lot of uh, industries uh, have done relatively well. Um, the sort you know sort of the haves are having more, the have-nots are having less. That's that's the case. So the part of the the part of society is going up the other part is going down and that's the k-shaped recovery and, and we're seeing that all around you know i think that if you are a stock market investor you're relatively happy right now if you are in the restaurant business uh around the world regardless of what the restrictions are you're struggling a number of industries are struggling uh mm -hmm. and i think it is accelerating a number of uh you know a number of phenomena that we were seeing around uh you know the, the automation around uh, remote work. Uh, and so if you work in the knowledge economy, like I think many of us do, we're doing okay. We can, you know, uh, have video conferences. Uh, but right now there's a real crisis going on for people that don't have sturdy 401ks or, you know, in retirement funds or investments um, and are really struggling with not just the impacts of the pandemic, but just the general trends around uh, sort of, you know, financial security, uh, healthcare, uh, all of these challenges that were, uh, you know, really bubbling to the surface before are now even more. And so now, I, you know, I think, you know, you can say that, yes, the markets have done better. A lot, you know, a lot of things, there's a, there is an expectation that we're going to experience an extraordinary economic rebound in the U.S. Um, and that could happen. Uh, but also at the same time, there are going to be, 
second and third order impacts that we don't even understand yet. Mental health challenges. There are going to be economic challenges that are going to emerge. There are going to be tons of international dynamics that we haven't even really confronted yet because this is novel, because this because we can't really uh, compare this to a, any previous event. And that's going to be really what I think the rest of 2021 looks like into 2022. And we're going to be sort of navigating this very uncertain landscape for, you know, for some time. It's like the wild west for all of us. That's the only thing that's encouraging is we're all in it together. Um, can, can I add to what Scott said, Natalie? Yes. And then I yeah, have a yeah, question just, specifically for you next. So that's perfect timing. Okay, great. So Scott, I think you brought some, you brought up some really, really good points here. But aside from that, and and I've I've lived in in U.S. for a while. So aside from that, what I've seen also with the new administration coming in, the world have this expectation that U.S. will rebound quickly, and then U.S. is going to play that big brother role and come and 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 you know provide uh, uh, respite to to other developing countries. Now this is also. Um, a lot of the a lot of the discussions we are having here in Asia is that how does what role would China play in the what so we call the recovery process and what role will U.S. play in that recovery process will dictate the future geopolitical uh, uh, sensitivities in the region. And I'm bringing this for the Asia Pacific as well in terms of how the U.S. is playing. So this is actually a very critical time, 2021, getting into 2022. It's a very critical moment uh, uh, for us. And I'm sure, uh, you know, Commander Shibu would, would uh, agree with this in terms of the security aspect as well, because a lot of the diplomacy that happens is people come in with a social agenda at the end uh, of the day, there is a security agenda associated with that. So this is, again, another thing that we wanted to kind of like alert. Can so, I make one yeah. quick point? Sorry. And I think what's really interesting what you're saying, I think one of the the results or the, 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 uh, the ramifications of this is, an, is a deterioration around uh, democracy, around form of government, the United States, you know, has lost an, a lot of um, a lot of its status as a sort of a, as, as a government model to emulate, and in that vacuum comes China. There's an, you know, it's more authoritarian. There was a lot of questions about the early response, but there are, you know, there they certainly have managed the public health piece of this uh, much better, and there is just a growing you know, outside of the U.S.-China tension. There is a growing sort of departure or movement away from democratic ideals. And I think that's one of the, the sort of high level uh, arenas or sort of stages in which we're, there will be this battle around what are the governance structures that are most equipped to deal with some of these 21st century challenges. And the U.S., which was frequently sort of touted as the model that a lot of countries were emulating, is no longer in that very strong position partially because of the last four years in terms of our, you know, our, our president and the, all of the division within our country, but then also the response to the pandemic was uh, an additional in, embarrassment. Uh, and on that note, too, Shabu, I would love to hear your thoughts and Shanti as well on this. You know, there's, um, there's a new report that came out that one of the biggest mysteries of COVID-19 was why the death toll is relatively low across much of Africa and Asia. And then when you look at the U.S., um, in, in continents like the U.S., where you have this assumed idea that you're both speaking to of, of being able to handle situations like this, you have quite the opposite. And it's hitting the hardest in these low-income, low-resourced areas. Um, so people are trying to look at this and say, where is this discrepancy? Like, how are these perceived lack of resources regions actually doing much better on survival rate? Um, and Shibu, you and I were speaking the other day about India and how things are going with the vaccine rollout and how you're waiting to go home and the pot to get your vaccine shot and just watching it and, and how well it's going. So I'd love, love for you to speak to that um, piece that just came out in the New York Times and, and your own experience there. Uh, is that to me, Natalie? Yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, yeah, I mean, uh, the rollout uh, in India per se, uh, has been uh, very efficient, uh, to say the least. Uh, 
there is a site through which people register. My parents have uh, on the plus 60 category, they have got that vaccine. The whole process uh, managed and done in a very streamlined fashion. So they were uh, pretty impressed. At the way it was handled, so there is a ICU facility on the standby. There were doctors on standby. They are kept under watch for half an hour after the shot. So there was a whole process to it, which was laid down, and like the SOP, it was followed to the T. So that was really good. It's a good experience, and uh, I think most of the 60 plus have got it done now. So we are expecting um, the 45 to 60 category, which is going to come up soon. And uh, so there, there is a structured process in the layer uh, in the uh, in, in the rollout there. The the second part uh, which you said was about the death toll and uh, and uh, associated things. Yeah. So th that's the last point is the mortality of the COVID uh, factor. So uh, I uh, India is a federal structure, as you may be aware, and I am in a southern state. It's called Kerala. It's uh, it's the first democratically elected communist government in the world. So they have certain communist ideologies where they keep the human human at the forefront, and then the, uh, the businesses and the other things at the background. So healthcare is uh, pretty big here. Uh, they do really focus on healthcare, which helped the transition uh, from a colonial past to a growth pattern very, very quickly. Uh, education and healthcare are always on top of the government. Uh, healthcare, what they have done is they've invested in the healthcare sector over a period of the last 50 years. So it's a pretty decent healthcare uh, setup in uh, the state in which I am in. The number of beds are available in plenty. Uh, so what uh, I, I, I mean, the numbers may be right, the numbers may be wrong. There is a lot of disputes on the numbers. There is absolutely no uh, question there. Uh, numbers are not a reflection of the reality. I think many more may be infected. But the good part is that uh, the hospital beds are still available. Uh, so like some of my relatives were uh, diagnosed and confirmed positive. So even though uh, they, they didn't have a serious case, uh, but since they could afford it financially, they went and got themselves admitted in a hospital and stayed there uh, through the event so that they could be under observations. Actually, So the good part was, you know, the bed was available. So even if you're asymptomatic, if you feel you have the uh, wealth, you want to get admitted, you can. And for uh, the poorer segments also, or uh, somebody who can't afford to pay, there are, there are government centers where uh, they can admit, even if you're asymptomatic, uh, with the food and uh, stuff like that. So, and, and the surprising thing Nathalie, is that the mortality rates, not, uh, you know, it, it's not extremely high. The uh, graveyards, or so to say, the end, end point, it, it's not flooding the graveyards or the crematoriums. There is no pressure on them per se at the end point. Uh, so, so the so if you work backwards, you know there is a mystery there. We don't know the uh, complete uh, fallout. Maybe the numbers we projected uh, are not spot on. So we don't know all those things. But the good part is yes, the, the mortality rates are less, the beds are available, and the uh, rollout has been uh, positive. Thank you, and Shanti, I know you wanted to speak a little bit more about that flow of capital to emerging economies and what your thoughts are on, on what you're seeing. Yeah, I think um, there is a big difference between how the uh, provincial and the central are uh, managing the COVID pandemic here. And, and people in the big cities are, of course, confining themselves into their homes and all that. But then, um, you know, I during the lockdown period, I um, managed to drive um, towards the provincial and what we see is people are just also just going out they are not just staying at home um, herd immunity I'm not quite sure but there is something maybe because if it's outdoor you know, the air the pollution towards provincial areas are more cleaner and health hence the you know immune system is, is uh, a lot better but one thing very very uh, interesting I note as well is that uh, over here, people would would uh, save money in the provincial area for their 
to buy this what we call it the handphone pulsar which is the uh, the uh, uh, refill for the handphone so they can stay connected on the uh, you know if they don't have wi-fi they can stay connected uh, in the internet and and do stuff right um what i've noticed is that people tend to save equal money between food and whatever equipment or investment they need to do to access technology or to access the internet so even outside in the provincial area we see this technology which i think some of us shared today especially during the pandemic time has actually taken uh at as the front seat and moving forward the question is that people will be still continue to work from home at least i have um you know i have turned my second floor into office here but the question i'll be asking here and you know again let me know if this is the same in the us between food security and technology security now because people if they don't have access to an internet this phone becomes useless you can't do anything much with this right mm-hmm. so that technology security has become such an important thing in the last one one and a half years mm-hmm. where it actually stand quite close to the food security part and this is one thing which i've observed um, in asia and and when i talk to my cousins in the us and you know i still have families there they they probably say the same thing because everybody is sitting at home but everybody need technology to get connected to the outside world right now this is just one one area which i actually wanted uh, to share in terms of i think the provincial area is managing the covid much much better way i don't know whether they have the the beds that they need or there is more friends and families helping them but or even well, the environment or the pollution but definitely the provincial area is doing much much better than us in the city thank you for sharing yeah. that um that's that's encouraging and i know we're getting close to we have a like you know 6 7 minutes left so i want to throw a question out there but please also if there's something that we haven't covered um but i think that it's interesting to think about this as it affects entrepreneurs um innovation thinking forward as we rebuild um and i really am curious from you know the different hats that each of you wear um speaking a little bit to those rebuild efforts and if this could be an opportunity for marginalized communities in the past to to have an opportunity to move forward you know here in the US we've had lots of conversations about racial inequity over the past few months that have been come heightened during this time um and we're wondering like as we're looking to invest in new ideas and new people um you know is this an opportunity for us to rebuild better but i i Can I uh, I may add uh, something here I think that the focus and we've talked gosh we all of us probably been engaged in forums and talked about what happened during the pandemic and I and I feel I've always called it ACDC right um after covid and during covid there's no pre covid anymore and and I think during covid we lived it after covid I feel when we talk about uh uh a little bit of a social justice or equality as you mentioned I think there is something that we ought to all globally be very aware of and that's hoarding vaccine. So so let's forget about the pandemic a little bit right now. Let's talk about what is happening today. Today I we have two things that are very concerning. Uh almost 14% of the world population um uh, live in wealthy countries. And wealthy countries based on the stats that we've been seeing around have put their hands on 53% of the vaccines to vaccinate 14% of the world population. I think that is a major issue and major problem that we have to pause it and can us step step back and say uh we united I mean the the the, the we're here to discuss united by covid-19 right are we going to stay united post covid post 2020 uh how are we as wealthy nations going to look at the uh less fortunate nations and perhaps share some of the vaccines I mean when you talk about 53% of the vaccine manufactured hoarded by wealthy nations we could probably vaccinate two to three times our populations and i and and i would name countries out there the us uh canada the uk unap- unapologetically hoarding vaccines right so what kind of social responsibility do we have uh, from a leadership standpoint across the globe to share back some of that vaccines because we're leaving many many behind that 
would not probably get the vaccine in this in their lifetime or for the next five or seven years. Another thing I would like to kind of quickly wrap up with is the um, hoarding patents, right? I mean, hoarding the, the, the formulas and the patents uh, for the Pfizer, the AstraZeneca. I get it that we're all they're all funded by government uh, research, but isn't that the time perhaps not to repeat what we learned through the Ebola crisis, through the HIV crisis? And, and perhaps share uh, the patents and, and produce them at a mass scale uh, across across the world. So these are a few things that I think we ought to start thinking about, and I would love to see more forums talking about this and perhaps making an impact. Thank you. We have a couple more minutes, so everyone has like a minute to wrap up their thoughts on those things. Can I just take a stab at that, and I will, that will, I will, that will count as my, my, my wrap-up comment. Yeah. So I agree with everything Mario said. I think it is worth looking at it from a different perspective, and I'd like to sort of end on a slightly positive note. I would say as someone that's been looking at this issue for a long time, uh, it could have been a lot worse. The, the expectations of hoarding were even greater than we have now. Uh, Covax is both uh, a, a overwhelming, a more of a success than we ever could have imagined and a big disappointment. Um, I think what we saw in 2009, was you know was was a suggestion that that all countries would would restrict all exports of these vaccines until their entire populations were spoken for and we're, what we're seeing now is a lesser version of that still not good but a lesser version of that and my final point on a point of optimism is that you know, we all talk about vaccine hesitancy vaccine vaccine skepticism I do think it's possible not guaranteed that we will be entering into an era of vaccine optimism as people understand the value of vaccines in ways that, you know, many people in the U.S. haven't. They, yeah. The vaccines will be a big part of our return to normal. Uh, there will be, I, mean, I, I think the mRNA vaccine is an incredible innovation that has uh, potential far beyond COVID. And I think the, the, the benefits of this vaccine uh, for a number of other health issues and the broader possible benefits, not I'm not guaranteeing that, of people's uh, greater appreciation for the value of vaccines is something that I think could be a positive outcome of this uh, crisis. Thank you for that. <laughs> yes, and Nancy, I would uh, like to conclude uh, by uh, directly responding to what you had said about the marginalized and you know, haves and have-nots. So I think there are two ways of looking at it. One is at a very individual kind of a level and one is at the rather larger collective kind of level. So I think uh, in the, in the have-nots, uh, let's not talk about the haves, let's talk about the have-nots. Uh, there are smart people out there and uh, not so smart people out there, right? So the uh, the what we are really seeing is the uh, smart people in the have-nots have uh, innovated very quickly. And uh, they have, uh, you know, jumped from the have-nots to the haves. Because it, it, because it, it's also a kind of an opportunity to jump from, you know, one spectrum to the other. For example, uh, there was this uh, story I was reading. He was a kind of a Swiggy Zomato kind of a delivery boy. Uh, and, he, and they suddenly lost uh, everything when the pandemic stuck and everything had to shut down. So then uh, this boy actually started uh, making cups of tea, chai or tea, and started delivering to the houses. Uh, so, and that, that's growing. That, 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 that model is suddenly growing and he's got a flourishing business now. So those are the smart people in the have nots who will jump to the haves. Uh, on the larger collective level, uh, you know, where a lot of the other work is going on, uh, at the government level, uh, it, it's really a tough question because uh, most of the governments across the world are uh, becoming nationalist by nature. And that's why uh, they, they are not open to collaboration per se. And they are shutting themselves off into this uh, kind of kubun. And then uh, it becomes difficult to see how they will emerge. Uh, but, uh, but on a larger level, the market seems to be responding pretty well. Uh, whether it's just a bubble or uh, whether it's reality, time will tell. But uh, at, at the collective level, I think uh, there's a lot of work which uh, needs to be done to ensure that the not so smart people in have nots are uh, taken care of. Because uh, ultimately, you know, when the haves cannot lead a happy life, 
if you are surrounded by have nots who who are uh, you have the extreme of the society because yeah. hunger and those kind of thing can force people to do things which can make life extremely difficult for everyone so yeah that's a great point i i really appreciate that we're seeing it here and shanti i want you to have a chance to please jump in yeah. yeah i i'll not take uh, you know long but then very quickly this is something which is i think we need to collectively even the post pandemic uh we need to work closely the developing